architect. And I remember him telling me, hey, you know, this is going to be kind of a landmark because this is the first glass facade curtain wall building in Macau in the 1980s. And funny enough, you know, currently my office is in this building and I have the opposite view. You know? <laughs> so I grew up with this view and I witnessed the city you know, being built in front of me. Just want to share that Benya, as you know, Jigao San is where Manuel Vicente lived. And I have some memories of him driving his Rover Vitesse, parking his car. And uh, some people sit in the neighborhood were not really impressed by his driving. But <laughs> <laughs> I want to skip that. But, you know, I was a kid in those days. I played in the neighborhood and I remember him, you know, just walking around and driving, parking his car. So what, what does hybrid mean? So I'm not going to be very technical here, but just conventional wisdom will say that these two pure entities, say, uh, uh, you know, fuel engine with an uh, electric motor and uh, produce a hybrid car, or uh, uh, a Portuguese man marries a Chinese woman, so it's a descent hybrid, and so on. So there's two pure entities, there's this concept of two pure entities that are put together and can something exceptional, not exceptional in the case that it's superior, but exceptional is that it's something that's not supposed to happen, it's against nature. <laughs> it's not that I, I agree with it, but there we also have, always have this thinking, that, that these two, you know, black and white together mix, or, you know, this kind of thing. So it's no longer pure, you know, they mix together. But obviously, I, I, when it comes to our mechanism identity, it's not that I agree with this view, because we mechanisms in Macau, we've been mixing with each other, you know, for centuries. So how about that? say that, hey, our hybrid identity is a pure identity in itself. Because let's say we've been mixing with each other for centuries. Now my son took this picture last year, he was three years old, and he can speak fluently Portuguese, English, and Chinese three years old, and he can, when I say fluently, is as a native, as a native speaker, just like myself or my wife and my parents. And why is this possible? Obviously because we provide the conditions for it, you know, at school we speak Portuguese or at home I speak Portuguese with him, then uh, with the, at home with the Filipino helper speaks English and so on, in the streets we speak Chinese. But I cannot hide the fact that I also think that it's in his DNA already. It's encoded in his, in his genetic code, you know, just like myself and my ancestors. Because not only he is able to, to do this, but he is also, he has this uh, will to help translate and help people communicate with each other. So he was three years old at the school, he was already helping the his teacher who is Portuguese, to say things to the Chinese help at the school, translating. So it's not only the ability to speak different languages, but it's also this thing that, hey, he knows that he is in the middle of everybody and he can do this. So I think this is in our DNA already. Now, obviously, our Macanese community, we are a small community in Macau, but I do believe that the local Chinese and whoever, local people who lives in Macau, or whatever community, we are all a bit hybrids. So just the way we speak Cantonese here in Macau, if we go to, cross the border, go to Zhuhai, we cannot speak the same way. People, Chinese people in Zhuhai will not understand the same type of Cantonese that we speak in Macau. We have some words from English influence, like si do, you know, si do, do, si, ek, si, kem, kem. Or can we, I want to claim him, you know. So we have this kind of wording. So the Cantonese we speak is hybrid, it's, it's different as a, this English influence. And Portuguese works actually also. I, I'm a, I work for the government since 2003. So when I speak with my colleagues, Chinese colleagues, there are words that they, they never use, they never say it in Chinese like boss, you know, low side. They say, oh, chefy, chefy, you know, they use Portuguese, chefy or Folger, you know, or Bauta, <laughs> and Brusessu, you know. It's Chinese people, they, they speak this way. The word in the government, Daimati, right? Where does this word come from, you know? Chinese tradition say Fan Ke, right? But they say Daimati, 
ready to put tomato, tomato, Portuguese, I don't know, but it's strange, only in Macau, right? As a mechanism, some people say, hey, the Macanese people speak the substandard Cantonese. In a way, it's true. We have all way of speaking Cantonese, right? So I make an effort to speak a correct formal Cantonese. And once I was talking to my boss, he's Chinese, and I used the word on uh, which is the correct word to say process. And my boss was, what? He said, on Oh, you mean process? Yeah, yeah, process. <laughs> and he's Chinese, you know. So this is funny things that happen in Macau. So I think everybody is a bit hybrid in the whole city is like this. So we live in this environment, and I think the key thing here is that it's not that, oh, I'm with these people here, so I'm going to behave like this. Or, oh, and those are Chinese, I'm going to behave like that. No. In our everyday life in Macau, we automatically we switch. We switch the language from Portuguese, English, or Chinese. We, 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 when we do this, we are also switching our body language, change the tone of our voice. And I truly believe our thinking also. I was thinking myself about this issue. If somebody approaches me with a specific issue or problem that wants to discuss, I may give different answers or get different conclusions if I'm speaking Portuguese or Chinese. It's true. Because if I'm thinking in Chinese or speaking Chinese, maybe I will ad adopt a kind of thinking that will be different if I'm thinking in Portuguese. This is very true, and I think it's very intriguing. Now, but what I wanted to say is that we switch automatically. You, you can ask any mechanism uh, how he memorizes numbers. I think nine out of 10 we say memorize in Chinese because it's easier. Even if we are native Portuguese speakers, we will memorize always in Chinese, it's easier. So that's how it goes. Now, you go to the Google, you put rings of St. Paul's, and you will find this picture, and many different versions of this picture, actually. Apparently, people find, find it very interesting that, you know, you can have a Chinese temple next to a you know, church. Uh, this is wow, really, you know. I can tell I would never be able to take this picture, never. Not that I, I I'm, you know, I'm offending and saying this is not good. No, I'm very proud of living in a city where this kind of thing happens. But I tell you, I played football when before Carrig de Grasse had this project implemented in the back of the ruins of St. Paul's. I played football there, I fly a kite, I played there. And nobody ever told me, or I was never taught that, you know, this is not supposed to happen, this is something exceptional. No, because I grew up in a city like this and we are we face these kind of situations every day. So this is why I put like, why not? What's wrong with this? <laughs> why is this so special? Of course it is. But we, we grew up in Macau. We had these kind of situations every day. I was having a chat with uh, Professor Jersey here in the beginning. I said, you know, in Macau, this is one of the few places that I can go to a yam cha, you know, Chinese lunch. And after I finished finish my lunch, I asked for espresso coffee. <laughs> and there is never a waiter who had told me, I'm sorry, sir, this is a Chinese restaurant. I won't serve an express to coffee. <laughs> no, never, ever. So is this strange? No, we just do this natural. It's a natural thing. Mm -hmm. And the whole city accommodates, adopts this kind of thing. Now, the image of the city, what is the image of the city? You know, I have this thinking that we have the urban landscape. <laughs> So what we build, the buildings and everything, and the human landscape. So this is why I try to highlight the, how the people in Macau are, you know, the human landscape and the urban landscape. And actually, if we analyze the changes in Macau from the last 10 years, there's some dissatisfaction from the population. And part of the, part of the things that the population is not happy about is with the human landscape, right? It's not only the urban landscape. People see a lot of people that are not from Macau, have different cultures, so it's the human landscape. So I have this idea that, you know, the image of the city, the perception of the city is mainly these two things that are important.
So what is the image of Macau? You know, I asked, so what is the image of Macau? Is it this? Is this, this the image of Macau? Or this? Or this? What is the image of Macau? Now, when I was in the faculty in, uh, in, in, back in Portugal, in Porto, we used to discuss this thing of the landmarks, the exceptional architecture, exceptional buildings, and the ordinary buildings, ordinary things, you know. So if we say Paris, what is the image of Paris? I think most of the people think, oh, Eiffel Tower is the first thing that comes to our mind, Champs-Élysées and whatever. But maybe you ask somebody who commutes to work and lives in Paris, they will tell you that graffitis, North African people, metro, rubber tire, whatever, you know. So we have to distinguish the landmarks and the ordinary. And from what I think, the ordinary sometimes is more important than the landmarks. So what is the situation of Macau? I put here some, I put some key ordinary elements. So I'm not going to make many comments, just let the pictures, the picture speak for itself. Rooftops, this kind of thing. Now funny thing is that why do I say that it's ordinary things that create a strong image? Because this is the case of this uh, window here, for instance. I think it's quite remarkable, the, the result. But do you think that the person who built this, did he think that, hey, I'm going to put this window frame and paint the yellow color, you know, and it's, wow, it's going to be really unique and bang, you know, wow. No, I rather think that this guy here, he just, well, he installed the window and then he thought, you know what, with the humidity of Macau, this is going to get rusty, so I better paint it, paint it just to avoid it getting rusty. So he grabbed the first can of painting that he found and just painted yellow. And that's it. And that's how this kind of thing repeats itself along the whole city and then that's how you create the image of the city. So just like this one, this is a good one. This guy here most likely he had the same idea and asked his neighbor, hey, give me some green paint that you have in your house. <laughs> you just paint it and that's it, you get this result. And that's the image of the city. And this here went to the closest store I have a privacy problem here, just go to the clothes store, hey, give me, give me some stickers, you know, what color, whatever you get, you know? and then you create this. This is what I really think happens in the house. And you got this, this, and so on. This, the legal facade. And the funny thing in Macau is that we have some materials like this one that really mark an era because you know, we have, Macau is a small city, so it's not that you have a big market, you want to, you know, bring the, the people who uh, work in sales and uh, exports and imports, not that they're going to get uh, everything from the catalog. They just get this and this. And it's very common in Macau, you go to a store, oh, no, we don't have this. Can I order it? No, not, not for you, you know. Just if you have a uh, hundred or a thousand, yeah, okay, I, I will do it. But just for one or two customers, no, I'm not going to get this material here in Macau. It's very common, you know. And then we got this, maybe this type of material that repeats itself, you know, infinitely in the 80s or 60s or whatever. And then it creates this strong image that what we have in my mind, in our mind. So the <coughs> procedure, you know, this kind of thing. And that's how how it goes. <coughs> Fluorescent light, the neon lights, you know. This is one of my favorites. I think this is very Macau, very local. Now, I will not hide the fact that I was partly influenced by a book that was published in 1991 by Manuel Vicente, together with Manuel Rassilias and Melinda Rosendo, called Macau Gloria. And this book actually sums up a bit what I've been talking about. It, this, is, this book is amazing. They have a collection of photographs they, that they took, I think, in the late 80s from the things that I showed before. 
<coughs> and why is this important? Because as I say, key elements that shape the image of Makai, I think that was the whole thing of the book. And I truly believe that Manuel Vicente was, you know, very much, you know, his were very much related to this kind of thinking. So now just I'm gonna show some buildings that, uh, you know, where I played when I was a kid. This is of, of course the 1980 in the Silfu of the area. It's very interesting, you know, the, this box here is like uh, in this entrance, it's like something completely different in the metallic structure. And when you are here in the entrance, it's like you are neither inside or outside the building, it's something in between before transitioning to the inside of the building. So there's a continuity of material from the facade that goes inside, and then you have these different perspectives. It's very interesting. I played here when I was a kid, you know, in these corridors, you know. You just walk in here and it's so nice that you can go up there, this balcony, you're looking down, you know. So it's, there's a richness in the spatial area. It's not just like the material, the way he played with this. And as I said, when I was a kid, I played a lot here. The, these buildings in Baja, I'm sure you know, or you all know, very well, some details. Now, I, we, when I was a kid, I had many friends that lived in these three buildings, but we mainly played here because this, the orange building is a bit different. It has this uh, opening here. It sucks you upwards, actually. And uh, when you are inside, you, you have all this thing, you know, just looking up. Now you have this, uh, they put this thing in here, but why is this? a nice place because when I was a kid this space was so three-dimensional that we could just look up and down and everything so I played here with my friends we played you know with airsoft guns you can shoot each other up and down <laughs> and, uh, and you had all this as I say the three-dimensional thing you know and it, for kids you know it was very good you know because it's just not a narrow and boring corridor it's, you have all these things and uh, it, it really helped us, you know, <coughs> to pass our time. Then, obviously, you have the transition to the blue building and this very funny thing, I think it's so interesting here, you know. I was there the other day to take some pictures and I couldn't stop myself smiling and laughing. You know? <laughs> I think he, he kind of, you know, oh, this is a transition between the two buildings. Okay, just paint both colors. I think it's just so <laughs> interesting, the approach, you know. So some um, staircase. I think these are regional, I'm not sure, but I think it is. And some details. I think this is very local, you know, the way it has these uh, metallic structures. So finally, this is one of his masterpieces from my perspective. I think this is the only time I met Manuel Vicente in my life was in uh, Professor Eric Fly's book presentation. He was there, I was there. We had a brief chat. And I remember briefly that we were discussing the concept of the fifth facade. He had this thing about the fifth facade, which is the, the, the rooftop of the buildings and how the fifth facade is important in Macau. I was talking to Rui some days ago, and uh, he, he said something very interesting about that the buildings in Macau have the, the hard part and the soft part. So the hard part is the, the brick walls, the concrete walls, the structural parts, whatever. And then you always have the, this illegal rooftop and metallic structures and these things. And I think it's very true. And here in this project, I think it's, it's very you know, clear. Now, what I think here, when I look at this, I think this is an illegal structure. <laughs> and I think this was his approach. And I'm going to explain to you why. You look at this, this is something that you will find in many places in Macau, this detail here. You know this metallic structure with these profiles that are welded together and then you have a, the roof. This, you know. And this is a very rudimentary thing. You go to any place in Macau rooftop, you will find this, you will find this detail. Now why I think it's illegal structure? Because it's so obvious that, from my perspective, you have this round shape here, which is the plot, you know, the land area. And this thing had to come out, you know. He, I don't think that he thought, no, I have to oh, follow the shape. No, this is illegal structure, so just let it stand out. 
<laughs> this is the way I, I, I see it. My interpretation, maybe I'm completely wrong, but it's the way I see it. So look at this. Yeah, this is illegal. Let it stand up. It kind of uh, reminds me of the, some antennas, the TDM and CTM or whatever. I think it has some works. So I think there's some influence there, I'm not sure. But I think it's remarkable and I like the, the facade you can see here. It's a quite complex, multi-layered. We have many layers here. So it's a very interesting building. And when you go in, I was not allowed to take pictures inside. I have, I have very good friends in the fire department said, hey, just don't take any pictures inside. Which is a bit of a shame because you go inside this building and there's an explosion of colors and emotion. It's, it's, it's great. So just to finish my presentation, this is some of my interpretation of how, you know, some of the things I see in his works and I see along the city, you know. You know, this is, this is actually in my, my home, you know. <laughs> you see, Believe it. and so on, and different layers, and so on. So I could do this, I could do many of this, but of, of course I'm not going to do it because it's a bit subjective. <laughs> and um, anyway, I, I, I think it's good enough to understand the idea. And this is just to show what it is not. So this is uh, not by Manuel Vicente, of course. I think this is from Tabeda, right? Yeah. Is it? Right. And, uh, you know, I like this building, but then you have this and this is the Chinese roof. I think it's a bit over the top, <laughs> from my perspective, you know, with all due respect. And this is just to show that I, I, I think this is exactly what the work of Manuel Vicente is not. Mm -hmm. It's not about oh, this, this China thing, just put the wrong shape window and uh, just, no, it's not like this. I think he was able to get the, you know, these things that are really from a cow, you know, and just make his, his architecture. So just some quotes from Professor Eric Lai's book about what I've been talking about. So there's this interview, which is very, very interesting. Uh, so do you believe, as others say, is the case that your work Macau has been influenced by the culture and the local environment? And look at his reply, so I just took some keywords. I don't view Macau as a Chinese city. It's a foreign city of Chi on Chinese soil, built by Chinese craftsmen and workers who work with them, their skill, own skills and craftsmanship. And then it's very important. In Macau, it was clear there was European model at work, but one that has been displaced, its form changed. And when I see this, it reminds me of a little story when I was a kid. My mother bought some bacalhau, uh, and we had a Chinese helper who cook for us at home, and uh, she was from Sakhe, mainlander. She was very nice. So my mom explained to her a Portuguese recipe to prepare the bacalhau, you know, olive oil and maybe a garlic and whatever, salt, and okay, it was supposed to be a Portuguese bacalhau. So when we arrived home, we started eating, and there's something is wrong here. <laughs> it tastes a bit different. So what happened is that our our helper, you know, she was Chi she was Chinese. She put some ginger on it. You know? In Chinese, we say bao hong ke. You know, you have to put some aroma in it. And the thing is that I think it's very much this thing here, because she couldn't stop herself doing it her way. You know, or maybe she was not sure if what the mom said. Okay, just put some ginger. It should be this way. This is how I learned to cook, right? And it's very much what is written here. And about this one, did you ever try to appropriate the Southern Chinese architectural vocabulary? And he is very humble in his reply. I thought it would be condescending to try to appropriate Chinese architecture, something I did not understand at all. I think this is so nice for him. You know, a person of, with his weight, you know, and say something like this. But then, Apparently, he does, he does <laughs> accept the fact that he was influenced, you know, because there's this story that he was making the decoration in his apartment in Lisbon. Unconsciously, he did something that he realized. The lights were similar to the interiors of many Chinese temples, and there's this red paint, which happened to be called China red. So 
In a way, I think this is very much what I was saying. When you are hybrid, you switch automatically. Sometimes you do things subconsciously, you don't even know it. And then later you realize, oh, pff, I've been doing something like this. So this is very interesting. Now, just to finish, the way I see it, the Americanist cuisine. <laughs> you know, you all heard the story of the pogoka, you know, the Portuguese, Portuguese chicken that you can get in the restaurants in Macau, but you go to Portugal, there is no such thing as Portuguese chicken. <laughs> so what is Portuguese food in Macau? It's actually the food prepared by the Portuguese people in Macau. Is it not really Portuguese food? So Macanese cuisine, in a way, came out this way. With available ingredients, because in those days, you know, not that we arrived in Chalapkov and took the ferry to Macau, no, you know, they came from India, from Malay, from all these places, you know, many centuries ago, and you could not go to the internet, obviously, and <laughs> buy your ingredients and get it delivered in, at your doorstep. You just cook with the available ingredients that you could get in Macau, in the available tools, and the local interpretation of what I was saying about the ginger. And I think our MP's architecture is very much like this. We use the available materials, the available materials in Macau, the available tools, and then the local workmanship. And he was able to create his own thing. So this is how I see it. It's like Macanese cuisine. And I think the, the result is very delicious. So this is my presentation for today. Thank you very much.